Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, you know, my sister, she, uh, you may not know this about her, but every day she does the New York Times crossword puzzle because she thinks that's going to stave off dementia. <laughs> she doesn't know better. Any, anyway, uh, the, there's two things about, the, about my sister doing um, the daily crossword puzzle. The first is I will get random phone calls like, what's a nine-letter word for a swallowing tube? You know, esophagus or something. So that, that's one problem. The other problem is she reads the headlines. And so I'm constantly getting questions from my sister about crazy stuff that she read in the, in the New York Times. So, for example, what's the blue bird flu going around in Antarctica? Now, I had no clue, so I had to, of course, look it up. And it turns out penguins, the, the, uh, there have been 200 Gentoo penguins that live in the Falkland Islands that have been found, afflicted, and died from avian flu. And then it, it turns out it's actually worse for elephant seals and fur seals who've been having like large uh, numbers of infected and, and dying uh, uh, animals in, in the South Georgia Islands that are very right next to Antarctica. So Janet, I don't know. Stop reading, stop doing the New York Times crossword puzzle. In other news, so you know, a lot of people have been asking me, uh, do I have to isolate for five days? In fact, I just got a friend of mine in New York City who, <laughs> Brazilian friend who's a coach for our Brazilian team, uh, asked me, he'd get, just gotten COVID, and should he isolate? And I said, yes, you have to isolate for five days, although very few people are kind of even testing these days. So the CDC is now considering whether or not to change the recommendations to what we do for flu, RSV. Basically, 24 hours without a fever, stay home, and you know, and, and then you can go back to work, maybe wear a mask if you want. That has not been in the official guideline, but I know apparently they're in discussions, and it's probably time to start to start um, changing the recommendations for isolation, and I'll show you some data for that. So the no news is mostly good. <clears throat> if you look at hospitalizations are down, continuing to go down. The interesting thing is there's still a lot of virus around. I, I have a lot of friends who've, who've been sick. I was in the <laughs> elevator in my apartment. Three people were wearing masks. I said, well, I'm impressed that you're wearing masks, and they, they were wearing them because they were sick, and they didn't want to infect other people. So a lot of people still getting uh, sick, but hospitalizations are down. But as you look at the wastewater data, still a lot of virus. I mean, it's come down, but it's, it's almost at the levels of certain other times of the year. And Houston had a big surge. We're, we're still at 400% or four times the amount of virus in the wastewater that was here in July of 2020. But it seems like it's peaked. So it hasn't really changed in the last week so much. Hopefully it'll start to go down. But when there's so much virus around, and it's still around in the country, why does it seem like things are improving? And I think there's some good evidence why. So this is a study that looked at uh, prevalence of antigen. So how many people actually have antibodies that are, that are against the, uh, the virus? And this is a, a map that looks at 2020 in the United States and compared to 2024. And the deep purple is 90 to 100%. So this is all antigens. This means all parts of the virus. Uh, the, most of the people in the United States, over 90% in most states, are, have been exposed to some part of the virus. When you look at the nucleocapsid, which means you actually be infected. Remember, the vaccines to the envelope protein, which is on the outside of the virus, the nucleocapsid is on the sort of along the membrane. So if you've got antibodies to this, this means that you've been infected by the virus, not just vaccinated. I mean, you could have been vaccinated and infected like me. <laughs> vaccinated five times and infected twice. Uh, so it means I have antigens, to, I, I have antibodies to both the uh, spike and the nucleocapsid. And if you look, the vast majority of people in the United States, 90% have ex been exposed to the nucleocapsid. So even with vaccination, most people have been uh, exposed to the virus, which means we all have collectively some immunity towards the whole category of uh, COVID-19 viruses that have been evolved. <clears throat> What's amazing to me is JN1 hit within, you know, from the time of November when it was just detected to, uh, to February, you know, that's just a few, half a year, it is 99% of the virus. So it just shows you evolution, you know, really works. And, and, and some, when some people wonder about, well, 
that's a virus. A virus the replication time of a virus is a day. You know, so in six months, it's gone through many, many generations. So a lot of selective pressure, it, it's, it, uh, it becomes the dominant strain. Human evolution, you know, our, for us, it's nine months to have a, a, a baby. But, it, you know, if you sort of do this, the same math, over 10,000 to 100,000 years, we have the similar evolutionary pressure, which is why humans continue to evolve. The interesting thing about JN1, which is the dominant one, remember, I, the story last year was, was BA2.86, which is a European strain that had all these mutations, like over 30, and everyone was worried it would be the dominant strain, and it didn't really do anything until it acquired one more mutation in the uh, a spike protein, and suddenly, within six months, it's the dominant strain. So, fascinating vi uh, viral evolution. Uh, the good news is nothing, nothing new has emerged. So hopefully, if it stays JN1, uh, most, most of us will have been exposed. For those of you who have not gotten the uh, most recent booster, though, and I've gotten some calls about this, you should get the booster because that one is more effective against JN1. The earlier vaccines are not. So if you're over the age of 50, I'd say be sure that you've gotten the most recent booster, particularly if you're planning on traveling internationally. So I've got a bunch of other questions that I thought we'd just finish up today with some answers to the questions I've been getting. One question I've gotten from a lot of people is that I, you've given me evidence that when, you know, the pregnancy, the pregnant women should get vaccinated, but how safe is it for the neonates when they have an mRNA vaccine? So there was actually a recent study that looked at Sweden and Norway and compared neonatal risk to those uh, neonates who were, whose mothers had vaccines. And it, it turns out that they had uh, half the mortality rate. So uh, the vaccines not only protected the baby, but there was no negative effect of being vaccinated uh, on the baby. Uh, there's also been a couple of things, questions about long COVID in children. And there's been some you know, recent studies. The CDC has put long COVID in children to be about 1% of infections compared to adults where it's about 7%. But there was a review recently in the journal Pediatrics that looked at kids who had severe uh, COVID and, and found that the uh, prevalence of long COVID in that group who had been severe infected, particularly hospitalized, was almost 10 to 20 percent. So again, a reason why you should vaccinate your kids is because if they get severely ill, they do have these persistent symptoms. And then one last <laughs> one that I really <clears throat> sort of like, this was in Nature. You know, I've been worried about the fact that nobody likes scientists anymore. I mean, doctors are still up there, but science in general, what about, you know, the distrust for science? And there was a review that was entitled Global Trust in Scientists, and, and they asked many different countries, uh, populations, do you trust scientists? And the score was 3.62 out of 5, 5 being the best, 3.62 being pretty good. So it's good. We're, we're kind of trusted. But here's my favorite. Um, participants from Egypt, India, and Nigeria have the most trust in scientists, so that's where I'm going to move. The, the ones that have the least trust are Albania, Bolivia, and of course, Kazakhstan. That's because of Borat. I'm sure Borat is responsible for it. Sasha Baron Cohen, you've done that to Kazakhstan. Anyway, it, it does show that uh, most, of the, most people are still trusting science. I'm not sure that's true in the United States, but it's certainly true in Egypt, India, and Nigeria. Thank God for those countries. Somebody's got to trust us. And then the one last thing was a real interesting, uh, again, my sister, eh, what about Alaska pox? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, I didn't even know about it. So I'm reading about Alaska pox. It turns out there's a guy who died from uh, what's been called Alaska pox. He, he actually uh, has an immune, he has immune um, deficiencies syndrome, he had cancer, some other things. And it turns out there's this new pox virus. It's, it's related, genetically related to the monkey pox or the, the old world um, pox viruses that, lit, that is uh, in Alaska. And it's sort of in some of the small rodents. It's been found in Fairbanks. It's, it's in mammals that, small mammals that cats uh, regularly hunt out there. And of course, this is a cat problem. It's, and Lily is all excited about this. Where it's been, uh, in, where people have been infected, a lot of times they're, they're from these rodents, but it's because their domestic cats have, 
have captured these rodents and scratched their, uh, their owners. So it's, all, it's basically in this rodent population, but it's a cat's fault, which is another reason why you should never own cats. Anyway, I want to end today with just a couple of shout outs. First of all, I want a big shout out to medical students Nicole Niamango and Selena Guo, who are fellows for the Houston cohort of Link Health. This is a nonprofit organization that works to improving internet access for everyone. Very important for, for, for people. 23% of Texans do not have home internet. And if you think about that, that impacts their health care, uh, their services, the ability to get jobs, work uh, at home, uh, you know, and, and even go to school. So these two second year medical students work at legacy community health clinics. Uh, they go to back to school events, refugee, uh, refugee health fairs, and Harris County Wellness Clinics, and help patients sign up for the internet. So congratulations to them, it's really a good good uh, example of our medical students you know, trying to impact their community. And once again, I love the League of Women Voters. They're nonpartisan. They just want people to go exercise their, their right to vote. Early voting starts March 5th for primary elections beginning this week and runs until March 1st. So I'm not going to tell you to vote for it. Just vote for someone smart, intelligent, and thoughtful, <clears throat> whoever that might be. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have, it, we're excited to know that uh, we have a team of uh, investigators who are going to join the, the Federal uh, Artificial Intel Intelligence Initiative. We have an 11-member Baylor team of faculty who have been elected along with 200 of the nation's leading AI uh, stakeholders to participate in the Department of Commerce Initiative to support the development and deployment of, listen to this, trustworthy and safe AI. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> oh, Lord. Anyway, and finally, of course, the most important thing after our outstanding football season, we did have a very good football season, even though we have a quarterback from Ohio State. Uh, it was, uh, but the main receiver was from Michigan, so, you know, combination of the Big Ten. Uh, but after that, of course, we have the rodeo. The rodeo starts on Tuesday. And you know who is most prepared for the rodeo? <laughs> you got it, Lily. So uh, she's ready for the rodeo. The question is, is the rodeo ready for her? So have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. Look at that float. I think that's Howdy right there. Yes, it's Howdy's float, and I think we see a familiar little cup on this oh, float. Oh, look at that. That's Lily Klotman. It is. Unofficial Hi, mascot of Baylor College of Medicine. I love that hat. I think that's a Gucci hat she's wearing. Actually, I think it's called a Poochie hat. Get You're it, so you know. right. Oh, wow. She has expensive taste, that Lily Klotman. The best of the best. Yeah, so I wonder what she's going to be doing at the rodeo this year. Do you think she's going to see me at the other animals? I hope so, and I hope they don't recruit her for mutton busting either. <laughs> Representing Baylor College of Medicine, next up is Lily. Let's see if she can stay on for her mutton ride. Hang on, Lily, hang on. All right, Lily, we'll see you at the carnival. Have a good time. Bye, Lily.